Well, good morning, Harvest. It's great to be in the Lord's house, amen? Amen. Worshiping Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Mark Davis. I am one of those that serve as uh, one of the members of the pastor elder team here at Harvest. And I'm filling in today for Pastor Nick, who he and his family are enjoying vacation this week. They'll be back worship, worshiping with us next weekend, uh, but keep them in your prayers. They're suffering in Hilton Head, so uh, <laughs> I, I have pictures from him with, of the beach and stuff to prove that. So today, we're going to be continuing our study in the book of 1 Corinthians. We'll be reading through a rather short section of scripture here in the last half of chapter 10 and the uh, beginning of chapter 11. But it is loaded with application for our lives that could literally be taught on for hours but I'll keep it to about 35 minutes or so, if I can. So at this time, I would like to invite the ushers forward with Bibles. And for those of you who may have come this morning without a Bible, just raise your hand. They'll be happy to get a copy in your hand. And if you do not have a Bible of your own, please keep this one as a free gift from your family here at Harvest. So while the ushers are doing that, I kind of want to set the table, so to speak, about the passage of Scripture that we're looking at today. In this passage, the Apostle Paul reminds the Corinthians and us that the freedom that we have in Christ is a serious responsibility. Yes, we can eat what we want, we can do what we want with our time, and do what we enjoy, but with one very important qualifier. As Christians, we are part of the body of Christ, of His church, and are connected in a way that cannot be broken. From the point of our conversion, we belong to him, both body and soul. We are not our own. Please join me in prayer as we begin our look more fully into what God's word has for us today. Gracious Heavenly Father, I just echo the praises that we've sung today. I just thank you for this day, for the gift of life today, and this opportunity to gather together in freedom and worship you. I pray, Lord, that you would uh, just... Use your word to drive deep in our hearts. I pray that we would all be open and then be obedient to whatever it is you're speaking to us. And Lord, I just pray that the words I speak from from this podium would be yours. In your precious name we pray, amen. So please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and read along with me beginning with verse 23 and we'll go through chapter 11, verse 1. If you have one of those Bibles that the ushers just handed out, you'll find those passages begin on page 820. So let us read through today's section together, again beginning with verse 23. All things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. Let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor. Eat whatever is sold in the meat market without raising any question On the ground of conscience. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. If one of the unbelievers invites you to dinner and you are disposed to go, eat whatever is set before you without raising any question on the ground of conscience. But if someone says to you, This has been offered in sacrifice, then do not eat it, for the sake of the one who informed you and for the sake of conscience. I do not mean your conscience. But his. For why should my liberty be determined by someone else's conscience? If I partake with thankfulness, why am I denounced because of that for which I give thanks? So whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give no offense to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God. Just as I try to please everyone and everything I do, not seeking my own advantage, but that of many, that they may be saved. Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. In this section, Paul is finishing his argument with the Corinthians that began in uh, chapter 8 regarding attendance at pagan temple meals and meat offered to idols. The Corinthians were struggling with a proper understanding as Christians between knowledge and rights, which can lead to pride, versus love and freedom, which should lead to building up. Paul has been working on these points all the way through this letter, 
and is now emphasizing that as believers, we need to put others first and not create stumbling blocks in the way of fellow believers or in the way of the gospel reaching unbelievers. Paul gets right to this issue at the very beginning of our passage today in verses 23 and 24 and then verses 31 to 33 where he writes, All things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. Let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor. In verse 31, So, whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give no offense to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God. Just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage, but that of many, that they may be saved. As Paul did in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, he reinforces the point that as believers in Christ, we have freedom to do whatever we please in non-essential things, excluding, of course, sinful thoughts or actions. But that freedom needs to be expressed and filtered through love for others. The Corinthian slogan, which Paul repeats in these verses of all things are lawful and also heard as all things are permissible, has had very key qualifications added by Paul to make this point very clear. There are three of these qualifications that we need to keep in mind for our behavior as Christians. Is it helpful to others? Does it build up others? And does it glorify God? Again, in whatever we do, we need to measure whether it is helpful to others, whether it builds up others, and does it glorify God? Holding this type of mindset involves the exercise of restraint, sacrifice, humility, and a love for others, as Paul demonstrated to those he came in contact with daily in his life and ministry. For example, holding your peace when under false or unfair accusations is a form of restraint, and there are times when doing this to wait for the facts to fully come out is the right thing to do but it is not easy. Sacrificing for others can be as simple as after a long day of work, mom or dad comes home really tired, wanting to relax and get some me time, only to be greeted at the door with children who are fired up and ready to go, go to the park, play catch, bike ride, or some, something, do something with you. The kids have not seen mom and dad all day, and they want to spend some quality time with you. So even though you may be very tired, you give up your me time and do something with them. That is a sacrifice of something you want for someone else, done out of love. A form of humility is taking care of others before yourself, like making sure others are served at a meal before you get your portion, or choosing to take care of the chore or task that is the least pleasant to do like maybe cleaning the bathroom or changing that nasty diaper. All of these examples are driven by a love for others, not by how we feel. Paul tells us at the end of our passage today that he learned these things from Christ himself. So this brings us to our first outline point of the day. Serve others rather than seeking your own gain. Paul's ultimate goal as it should be for you as well, is for as many to be saved as possible. He chose to abstain or give up normally good and acceptable things in an effort to not allow any obstacle to be placed in the way of that goal and encourages you and I to have this same mindset by seeking to serve others ahead of ourselves. The way it is stated actually declares We have the freedom to serve others ahead of ourselves. Freedom to serve others. Consider that statement for a few seconds. Is that how you think about life? That you have the freedom to serve others. Now let's be fully honest here. We typically seek to be served rather than served, don't we? Especially if we feel we deserve it. What would it be like if you began to view serving others as an act of exercising your freedom in Christ 
rather than as an obligation to serve Christ. This could be a game changer in your life and your Christian walk. A recent example of this comes from a story from an event at the state track meet here in Iowa that was held just a couple of weeks ago. On Thursday, May 16th, the boys' 3,200-meter race was held. I am not a track guy, so that's eight laps around the track. In the 1A race, as the runners were finishing lap six, an official rang the last lap bell in error, causing a number of the contestants to think they were on their last lap. For distance runners, this last lap is typically where you pour it on. They go into what they call their kick, trying to finish as best they can in the race. So when the finish line was reached after just seven laps, several runners slowed down or stopped thinking the race was over. But one young man knew it was not eight laps yet. He and a few others kept going. That young man then finished the race first at the proper eight laps. So you would think he would be the winner, right? Unfortunately not. With the error that occurred, the officials ruled they would call the standings in the race at the end of seven laps, where this young man, whose name is Joe Anderson, was not across the line first. Here's the statement that this young man gave after the officials ruled they were calling the race at lap seven and taking away his race victory. Being stripped of my first ever state title hurts a lot, but my identity does not come from the trophies that I have won or the ones that have been taken away. It comes from who I am in Christ. I ran the absolute hardest I could. I am proud of that race. At the end of the day, it's not about how we respond when life goes great, it's about how we respond when bad things happen to us. Congrats to Will. He ran a great race. What a great example by a Christian of exercising freedom in serving others rather than fighting for or complaining about what should rightfully have been his. I would like to add that a few days later, the Athletic Association officials decided to declare co-winners in that race and they did give Joe Anderson a gold medal for finishing first at the proper time. Now, in serving others or seeking their good ahead of our own, Paul is not telling us that we are to be subservient or passive or permissive in our efforts to serve or to be so deferential that it looks like we're being walked on all the time, so to speak. Someone will take advantage of our willingness to serve them from time to time. But if our act of service was intended to glorify God, it was helpful, and was intended to build the other person up, then they are not manipulating us. We are exercising our freedom for the purpose of their salvation. Our next section of Scripture gets more specific on application of what Paul is writing to the Corinthians. So let's look again at verses 25 to 30 of 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Eat whatever is sold in the meat market without raising any question on the ground of conscience. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. If one of the unbelievers invites you to dinner and you are disposed to go, eat whatever is set before you without raising any question on the ground of conscience. But if someone says to you, this has been offered in sacrifice, then do not eat it. For the sake of the one who informed you, and for the sake of conscience, I do not mean your conscience, but his. For why should my liberty be determined by someone else's conscience? If I partake with thankfulness, why am I denounced because of that for which I give thanks? This brings us to our second outline point today on your bulletins. Consider conscience issues when making decisions. So Paul is now bringing consideration of conscience into this discussion. Now, I found this one of the hardest parts of this passage to try to teach on. So bear with me as we uh, slow down and camp out here for a few minutes to get as clear an understanding of this part of the passage as is possible on what Paul is trying to teach us here. So in verse 25, he repeats the freedom that those in Christ have in regards to non-essentials like what we can eat. In the next verse, he then ties that into a meal with an unbeliever, 
where meat will be served that more than likely was offered to idols or butchered by pagan temple priests prior to being sold in the marketplace. So I want to add a little historical context to this part of the passage on what Paul is talking about. So there were active Jewish populations living and working throughout the Roman Empire in these days, including in the city of Corinth. Now, it would have been no secret to a resident of Corinth, especially to vendors in the meat marketplace, that the Jews were a unique and religious people that had some very specific laws, traditions, and practices that they adhered to. In particular, not eating food that was considered unclean, and more specifically, meat or anything else that had been involved in any way in pagan temple activities. A Jew that went to the meat market to make a purchase would have thoroughly investigated what was available for sale and would not even consider the purchase of anything associated with pagan temple practices. Christians were often viewed by the pagan culture as a branch off of the Jews since both Jews and Christians claimed the same God. So, among the typical Greek unbeliever of Corinth, it would have been, not have been unusual for them to think that a Christian held to the same laws and traditions regarding meat or to unclean foods. So with all that said, if an unbeliever in Corinth invited a Christian to a meal at their home, as in Paul's example here in verse 27, it might be possible that the unbeliever was aware of the restrictions that Jews had regarding meat offered to idols. And in their own conscience, the unbeliever, they realized as they were serving a meal that they might be leading their guest into a violation of their religious rules or laws. Now, this is not something a good host wanted to do to their guest. So in Paul's example here, he brings out that possibility in verse 28 where he states, but if someone says to you, this has been offered in sacrifice. So this conscience dilemma for the unbeliever is why Paul states in the last half of verse 28 through verse 29, he states, then do not eat for the sake of the one who informed you and for the sake of conscience. I do not mean your conscience, but his. Paul has already pointed out that we have freedom in Christ and there is nothing unclean for us in regard to food in particular because thanks were given to God for the meal. Paul is concerned here for the conscience of the unbeliever, because if in their mind, the unbeliever's mind, eating the meat for the Christian was wrong, then allowing that to happen would be a conscience issue for them, for the unbeliever. As a Christian, we would not want them to think that they had led us into a wrong religious practice or a sin. So Paul states, we should abstain from the meat, in this example, for their sake. Now there's another side of this as well. So let's say the Christian tells his host, once hearing that the meat was offered in sacrifice, hey, it's okay for me to eat the sacrifice meat because I belong to Christ. I have freedom to eat. The host is going to need a lot more than that statement at the meal to work through just what's going on there. And if the Christian then went ahead and ate the meat that was offered in sacrifice after being told or warned, now the Christian is inviting judgment on himself by the unbeliever, which would be wrong and unloving for the Christian to do, and could, be very, and could very well place an obstacle in the path of the salvation of that unbeliever. So now I feel like I've taken kind of the long way around the barn to try to explain consideration of conscience here, but it's very crucial to understand the importance of considering conscience issues when making decisions especially as it relates to serving others and keeping the door open to sharing the gospel. So turn with me now to Romans chapter 14. Romans 14. And we're going to look at an excellent explanation of this topic, again by the Apostle Paul. And we're going to start in Romans 14, verse 13, and we're going to go through verse 23. It will also be on the screen behind me. So Romans 14, starting at verse 13. Therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. I know and am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing in, is unclean in itself, but it is unclean for anyone who thinks it is unclean. 
For if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love. By what you eat, do not destroy the one for whom Christ died. So do not let what you regard of as good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Whoever thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. So then let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. Do not, for the sake of food, destroy the work of God. Everything is indeed clean, but it is wrong for anyone to make another stumble by what he eats. It is good not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that causes your brother to stumble. The faith that you have Keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the one who has no reason to pass judgment on himself for what he approves. But whoever has doubts is condemned if he eats, because the eating is not from faith. For whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. Now in this passage, Paul is speaking to the believers in Rome about considering the conscience of other believers. And in 1 Corinthians 10, where we're at today... He is applying that same standard for the same reasons to the consideration of the conscience of the unbeliever as well. Now this points right back to Paul's driving factor for all of this. He wants there to be nothing in the way of salvation for those that are lost. So we now arrive at the last and shortest verse in our passage today, 1 Corinthians 11.1, where it says, Be imitators of me, as I am of Christ. Now, although this is the shortest verse today, this one has the most application to our lives and brings us to our third outline point today. Imitate Christ as a rule for life. Now, Paul encouraged the Corinthians to be imitators of him, as he is of Christ. So what things about Christ should we seek to imitate? The obvious and easy Sunday school answer is everything. But that's a little too easy, so we're going to get a little more specific here this morning. So let us start by looking at what things about Christ Paul has been discussing in this entire letter to the Corinthians up to this point, beginning back at the start with chapter 1. So in imitating Christ as a rule for life, the first point I'd like to talk to us about is extending grace to others. So Paul began the letter by pointing out the grace that Christ has extended to us. That grace was nothing that we deserved. Christ loved us and died for us while we were yet sinners. As it says in Romans 5 verse 8, But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Another way to look at grace is the acronym God's Riches at Christ's Expense. Christ paid the full price for our salvation, and as a result, at his expense, we who accept and believe in him are heirs with him to all the riches God has given him. This point hit home to me in a powerful way last August when my oldest son and I made a trip to Israel. As a part of the tour we were on, we visited the site that is believed to be where Caiaphas, the high priest, had lived. Caiaphas was the high priest in Jerusalem when Jesus was arrested. And on the night of his arrest, it is recorded in the Gospels that Jesus was brought to the high priest and put on trial late at night. Up on the screen right now is a picture of what is called the pit cell. This was taken by my oldest son, Chris, who was on on the trip with me. This is located under where it is believed that the home of Caiaphas had stood. I was journaling back home each day by email, uh, just describing what we had done every day on our trip and sending it home to my wife, Angel. And I recorded this about this particular day or this visit, this site visit on our trip. Our first stop was at a church that was rebuilt in the 1990s, under which is the remains of what is traditionally believed to be the house of Caiaphas, the high priest. To confirm this, they found his tomb, Caiaphas's tomb, on the property. And in the first century, only the wealthy could be buried on their own land. In addition, 
Under the house are prison cells, and outside there is a path that leads down a set of steps from the courtyard, goes around the Temple Mount area, and goes right to the Garden of Gethsemane. There is one unique prison cell that is a pit. And according to our tour guide, the Jews use these for only the most dangerous or most hated prisoners. After Jesus' arrest, he was taken to Caiaphas and accused, beaten, and then held at the same place until the next morning, according to Matthew 26, Mark 15, and John 16. Our guide took us down into the pit cell. They have cut a set of stairs into it, so you can do that. And we gathered at the bottom, and there he read Psalm 88. So standing in that pit, hearing that psalm read aloud, and knowing the physical evidence that supports this as being most likely the house of Caiaphas, I could not escape the overwhelming feeling that we could be standing in the very cell that Jesus was held in. It was deeply moving and brought a very profound sense of grief to me that I personally needed a Savior to pay such a price for my sin, and that Jesus did it willingly, knowing the full cost. What little in comparison does he ask me to do for him? How can I not? So I share this to remind us all, as Paul does, that we should imitate Christ with a willingness to sacrifice for others, to give them what they do not deserve as he did for us, grace. Be quick to listen, slow to speak, patient and long-suffering with others, especially when tensions are high. Be the first to apologize, the first to sacrifice and serve another, even if you do not feel like it. So the next item in imitating Christ as a rule for life that Paul talks about is pursue unity and forsake divisions. So in addition to extending grace, Paul calls then for us to pursue unity and forsake division, specifically in verse 10 of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, where he writes, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. To be able to walk out our faith and be an effective witness to the world around us, we must be united in the essentials of our faith in Christ and not divided on the non-essentials. People are always watching us to see if our faith is genuine. And Christ told us they will know us by the love we have for one another. There is not much love to witness among us as believers if we are divided on issues of preference, complaining about the way life is treating us, or even worse, talking negatively or gossiping about others. Seek to preserve unity by dealing with issues with others directly, with them, and reason together from the scriptures on how best to handle any differences there might be. The world does not need to see us walking in a rigid lockstep agreement on non-essential items like what food we eat, to drink alcohol or watch movies or not, or what day of the week to worship on. The world needs to see how we can have differences of opinion, and that does not divide us, and needs to see how we handle these situations is in a loving and respectful manner. Calm, loving, reasoned conversation in handling differences of views is sorely lacking in our culture today. This is another area where we as believers can shine the light of Christ in this world. So the next point that Paul brings up in imitating Christ as a rule for life is to ask God for spiritual understanding. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul calls for us to seek God for this spiritual understanding and that we should live out our life walking in the Spirit. If we do this, our life will produce spiritual fruit of various kinds, as described in Galatians 5, to 24, where it says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So daily... You should ask yourself, what kind of fruit am I bearing? 
And what sin in my life is interfering with producing spiritual fruit? If you are genuine and sincere in asking these things, God will empower you through the Spirit to put to death the things of the flesh, as His Word tells us, and walk in the Spirit. This will enable you to see clearly and better discern how to help others, how to build others up, and to glorify God. If others see that you genuinely care for them, that you have a deep joy that seems to carry you through tough times, that you are patient and kind to others, even if they are not in return, if people see these and the other fruits of the Spirit in your life, it will draw them to you and to Christ and open doors of opportunity to share the gospel, which is what we are called to do. The next item that Paul invites us to to follow and imitating Christ as rule for life is to love the supremacy of Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul declared that we should love the supremacy of Christ. Embracing this will help you to stay humble and not get caught up in knowledge or thinking too highly of yourself. As we noted at the beginning of this sermon, the Corinthians were struggling with knowledge and rights versus love and freedom. Putting your knowledge and what you view as your rights ahead of others leads into pride and arrogance. This will not draw people to Christ and could place many obstacles in their path to salvation. With a proper perspective, we should know that all things are Christ's and He is supreme, that we belong fully to Him both body and soul, and that He is the source of all the power we need. Seeing that Christ is supreme frees you from the slavery of sin for the sacrifices of love. Your faith in Christ and belief He is supreme is visible only to God. But the outward result that you are no longer a slave to sin and you are willing to make sacrifices for others out of love is visible to the world. Go be visible. The next point that Paul wants us to do in imitating Christ as a rule for life is to live in a way that produces disciples. In 1 Corinthians 4, Paul tells us this. He, of course, is urging us to carry out the Great Commission from Matthew 28, verses 18 to 20, where it states, And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So if we are to imitate Christ in our life in a way that produces disciples, what did he, Christ, show us by example? It is summed up very well in 1 Thessalonians 5.14, where it says, And we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, Encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. Jesus lived this out in front of others. It was not hidden. He taught, he encouraged, he corrected, he warned, he loved, and he grieved. He did all this and pointed constantly to God, demonstrating thankfulness, effective and fervent prayer, and refusing to conform to what people around him wanted him to do at times. He stayed true to God's plan. His last instructions are very clear to go and do the same. In doing so in the same spirit and power, you will produce the same results, more disciples of Christ. Our final point today that Paul wants us to do to imitate Christ as a rule for life is to pursue holiness. Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and a number of other places throughout all of his letters. The Apostle Peter also makes this clear in 1 Peter 1, 14 to 16, where he writes, As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, since it is written, You shall be holy, for I am holy. Pursuing holiness should enable you to be able to accomplish 
all these other points that we've discussed today. You will act on what you think. You will reap a harvest from the seeds that you have planted in your own heart and mind. So if you want a good, God-honoring crop in your life, you have to plant those seeds, right? So where do you find them? In his word and in fellowship with other believers. Know what God says in his word and do it. Put it into practice. Show him you are willing to trust him and he will meet you right where you are and empower you to imitate him to do these three things. Help others, build others up, and glorify God. I'm going to invite the ushers forward for our offering, and I invite you to close out the message here in prayer with me. Gracious Heavenly Father, again, we just come to you, praise you, and thank you for your word. Thank you for this message today, and I thank you, Lord, for the price you paid to redeem each and every one of us that belong to you. I pray for this offering that you would just use it to further your kingdom. We just thank you for the gifts you give us, and I pray that you would just bless this small portion we give back. In Jesus' precious name, amen.